So I'd like to uh, call this meeting to order. Um, I just like to first uh, start by um, acknowledging the death of John Corrigan. John was a longtime board member here, died recently. He was appointed to the board in 1998 and served for two terms, from 98 to 02, and then again from 02 to 06. He also sat as chair on the board for three years from 01 to 03. And uh, he was uh, um, on the inaugural board of the uh, Blue Mountains Public Library upon the amalgamation of the town. And uh, both he and his wife um, are active members of the gallery community. And John was also a vocal advocate of, the, of library services and often uh, supported us at uh, council meetings. So he was a great library champion. So with that, I'd just like to call for a moment of reflection. Thank you very much. So uh, moving on to the Indigenous Acknowledgement Statement, uh, we would like to begin our meeting by recognizing the First Nation, Métis and Inuit peoples of Canada as traditional stewards of the land. The municipality is located within the boundary of Treaty 18, region of 1818, which is the traditional land of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee and the Wyandot peoples. And now I would like to welcome, oh, what's that? We'd like to welcome Andrea Masterson, who's joined the uh, board uh, uh, from council. And uh, so we're really glad to have you. I know it's, at this point, anyway, it's only for a few months, but I hope you, uh, you enjoy yourself uh, with your time on the board. Um, and to help uh, introduce Andrea and ourselves to her, I'd like to ask um, each person to tell us a little bit about uh, yourselves, like where you live in the town, uh, maybe a bit about your work career background, why you joined the library board and some of your interests. So let me start <laughs> to uh, tell you that um, I live uh, I live in the Craigleith portion, just up the hill from the depot with a beautiful view of uh, both Craigleith and Alpine. And uh, I've been here well, I've had the chalet for 20 years and I've been here full time since 2015. Um, my uh, work career was in libraries. Uh, I worked with Southern Ontario Library Service and its predecessors since I graduated in 81. And uh, in the early days, I uh, actually, um, Thornbury and Clarksburg were part of my, um, my consulting group. So it, I was here in very early days at least from my perspective. <laughs> and um, yes, and that's why I was with Souls for 32 years in all and 20 years as CEO. And I joined the board for the obvious reason that I have all this library background and it was an opportunity to uh, contribute to my, uh, my new full-time community. And my interest, or one of the reasons I came up here was of course the skiing. I've been a skier here for years and I, join, I enjoy snowshoeing and hiking and the summer, it's more like tennis and cycling and some gardening. So, Morris, can I ask you to jump in? Yeah, certainly. Um, Andrea, this um, and everyone, this is um, my second term uh, on the board, which will make it uh, seven years in total. Wait, one more year to go. And um, uh, as far as background is concerned, I. Um, over a period of years, over the last period of years, managed two small companies at different times. One was in metal distribution and the other was actually in um, uh, management management uh, procedures, but I'll go on from there. Uh, we, My wife and I, Catherine and I moved up here uh, permanently in 2001, I think it was, um, but we've been coming up here for years because 
Well, like uh, like Lori, I've been a skier. I was saying, I just gave up my equipment. But uh, I've been, we've been members of uh, Craigley Ski Club for it's well over over forty years at this point, and Catherine is still uh, skiing. Um, I don't have the background of library science and stuff that Laurie has, but uh, uh, hopefully I brought some different outlooks to the to the to the uh, board. That's it. Thank you, um, Dorothy. Yeah, you know what? I'm just going to switch to try with video. Oh, okay. That sounds like a good idea. It's just going to... Uh, why don't we go on to Joanne while, while it loads, and then maybe oh. I can just, you know, greet people in person. Okay, sounds good. Joanne? Um, I've been here uh, 12 years. I'm not a skier, but I come from uh, Quebec where I did ski. And my husband is from um, a mountainous region of um, Italy. And we found uh, the flatness the flatness of um, Ontario monotonous. So this is the closest we come to hills. Um, I was a teacher librarian in a Oops. Uh, you're on mute, Joanne. Don't know how that happened. Okay. All there right. We, we heard you. I'm, I was a teacher librarian. Okay. In uh, a French immersion uh, elementary school for uh, some years. And uh, I've always had a love of the library. And uh, Andrea and I almost met several times uh, when my meniscus was uh, acting up. And I'd just like to remind Andrea that I um, signed her original nomination to uh, be on the council. Uh, and and uh, what I had asked her is, would she promise to stay awake during council meetings? And she said yes. And to my knowledge, she stays awake. There's an endorsement. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Dorothy, now that we can see you. Hey. Thank you. I, I, I just have to apologize. I'm in Blue Mountain close to Oslers on the 19th and our internet is sketchy at best. So I'll just um, say hi while I'm still here. I may have to go on voice only in a bit. Anyway, uh, I've been retired, kind of semi-retired for three years. I was the superintendent and chief negotiator for York Region District School Board. So I kind of know Joanne through that, uh, <laughs> through that track. Um, as I said, I retired three years ago, but I'm back uh, about a little less than part-time because of staff changes and COVID and all the other stressors in education these days. So that's, uh, that's been a bit of a pleasure. And let's see, prior to that, I was with the Toronto Public Library where I lived through both uh, pre and post amal amalgamation, uh, which was an interesting experience. And that's where I got my roots in, and uh, affection for libraries. So it's good to meet you. Oh, on a personal note, I've got a husband that skis. I ski badly. I have three daughters. Uh, most of whom don't live at home except for now. So, because of the word. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jesse. Hi, Andrea. Uh, I'm Jesse Glass. <clears throat> I uh, split my time between uh, Toronto and Laura Bay. I actually uh, was born and grew up in Toronto. And I was a practicing lawyer, essentially in the area of insurance litigation for 50 years. And then after that, I did another nine years uh, doing mediations and arbitrations. Uh, I've uh, owned uh, and lived part time in Laura Bay for about eight years now and uh, Love the area, love Thornbury, love the town of Blue Mountain. My wife and I have uh, children and grandchildren living in Collingwood. So uh, we felt very attached to the area. I've never been involved with libraries prior to my first term, which started three years ago, other than as a borrower and uh, 
avid reader of books, but uh, I have always been involved in uh, community activities, uh, both uh, primarily through the legal system. And I thought that uh, since I was no longer doing practicing law, there's something that I should be doing to give back to the community, uh, which was very kind to me. So I was allowed my name to be put up for the board and I've been sitting for three, three years and enjoying it very much. And uh, that's where we stand today. Great, thank you. Um, I see uh, Gary is coming online. So I'll just give him a second and then I'm gonna make him answer our questions. Oh, see, oh, there he is, okay. Hi, Gary. Hello, finally made it. Yeah, welcome, welcome. Um, your, your timing is propitious. Uh, we were just each introducing ourselves and it's, well, your turn. And just asking people to, um, say, you know, where do you live in the town, uh, your career, work background, and uh, why you joined the board and any of your interests so that uh, Andrea has a chance to get to know us all. Okay, well, welcome, Andrea. I Gary lot. I work in healthcare in the Niagara region with the health planning advisory body for the Ministry of Health uh, for my career. And I live in Windfall uh, here in the Mountain. And I joined the board because I um, felt it was important to give back to the community. And I felt I could do this. And I knew the board had had some trouble. And Fixed all the problems, so we're here to keep it moving. And, uh, uh, a lot of exciting things to, to come, of course. And, and it's, it's fun for me. I'm used to working with council for things like that, so it's sort of fun to do that. Like Some people don't think this is so exciting, but obviously we, we do find it fun. So. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Andrea, can I ask you to introduce yourself to the rest of us, please? Yes, well, thank you very much uh, for everyone taking the time out of the agenda to introduce yourselves because I'm, I'm learning something new about even the people that I did know, so thank you. <laughs> uh, and I joined the, the course of previous teachers here because I, uh, my previous profession was as a teacher. I spent uh, quite a bit of time teaching over at Collingwood Collegiate as well as Mountain View Elementary. Um, I'm a French teacher by background, so I taught from grades four right through 12 in, in the extended program as well. Uh, but I feel finished my teaching career down in Niagara College. So I, that was of interest when I heard what you're up to, Gary. Um, my husband is actually, uh, he works in St. Catharines. And so we, they, they do accommodate a place for him to stay when he has to go down there to be there physically. So uh, I managed to, to find a job teaching in the international department and uh, used my English as a second language skills there to teach academic English. So um, I was very pleased to have finished my teaching career uh, in that point. The only part I missed is that I really had a hard time with being down there Monday to Friday and only coming home on the weekends. That part really kind of ripped me apart. So I am very happy to be not needing to commute during the week at this point. Uh, I have my, my first foray into, I actually moved here with my kids uh, back in the year 2000. So it's been over 20 years now. And in 2001, I bought the property that I'm on right now. Um, the background picture here is in Egypt. So I live at south of Duncan in the very southwest corner of the Blue Mountains. And, uh, and I bought the, the place in Egypt as an empty property and then bought a fixer upper in Collingwood at the same time. So I could raise the kids while we were building this place very slowly due to budget. Um, and so I did begin my career there. I did resurrect my teaching career. Actually interesting because... Uh, I think, was it you, Joanne, who said, no, no, it was Dorothy, I think. Dorothy, um, my first teaching position was at uh, William Secondary in Aurora. So <laughs> I, I, I actually... Yeah, I actually grew up in Newmarket. So when I first graduated from the teaching program, I was hired by York Region before I even graduated, actually, and therefore found a place that was close by. So I did start my teaching career there. I left when I had my kids. And then my, when I came up here, I started back into teaching and got involved with the local schools here. 
And uh, it, along that process, I did sit on the Collingwood Public Library Board for four years. It was during the transition period when we moved from the old library into the new facility. So it was quite an interesting time, to be, <laughs> quite an interesting term to be a part of. And, uh, and while I was doing that, I was also involved here on the museum side. Because when Suzanne Ferry was the curator, I would come and I would volunteer for her events and I would help her with uh, record keeping and helping out with the archives and things like that in, in the Craigley Depot very early days. And in fact, that's actually where Rob Potter and I first got a chance to really cross paths together. So it's a, a cherished memory of mine. And uh, I guess the other, uh, so you can tell I have a love of history. I actually love digging up the history of where I live up here, but I also have a little studio in Clarksburg, which is in a hundred year old building. So I enjoy that kind of history too. Um, I have an art studio. So my interest is basket weaving, uh, but I actually share the space and we offer workshops in a variety of art media. And one of them is now my partner is my mother. <laughs> so, because during COVID, my dad moved into Aaron Rung and he has since passed away and my mom moved in with us. So she she is a celebrated Canadian textile artist, a tapestry artist, so she comes to weave in the studio and we share the space together and then we have some other artists that come in to teach classes too. So I have a fondness for the arts community as well, which of course our GLAM supports. So I am very excited to be here and I look forward to listening and uh, thank you very much to both uh, Lori and Sabrina for giving me a very good orientation so I can catch up to speed on all the hard work that's been going on. <laughs> so thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to A4 on the agenda. Just in terms of teleconference procedures, it'll be just like at a meeting, you know, hands up. Uh, and I can see all of you on the screen at once, so it won't be a difficulty being able to see that. Now, the uh, approval of the agenda. Can I get a mover and a seconder for the agenda? I see uh, Joanne moving it and I see Dorothy Seconding and uh, any uh, changes to the agenda at all? No? Okay, all in favor? Oops. Okay, now I can't see everybody. Just see. okay, there we go. <laughs> That's the trick. <laughs> okay, that was carried. Um, are there any uh, declarations of pecuniary interest or general nature thereof? Seeing none. We'll move on. Uh, there's a number of reports to be uh, received. Um, a list of seven of them here. The uh, close of year report, the interim Q1 action report, the CEO service update for January, respectful workplaces compliance report, continuous improvement report, strategic planning working group update for January, and the agenda and multi-year agendas. Can I have a mover and seconder to receive those? I'll move. Okay, moved by Morris. And I saw Gary for seconding. Um, all in favor? Okay, opposed? Thank you. So looking at the um, minutes, we have uh, three sets of minutes, the November 25th, the closed session minutes of the same day, and the EPOL minutes of December 9th. Um, I believe in one of those sets of minutes, I think I've told Sabrina that there was a, a yellow highlighted place and, and my note said that Morris had been the mover of that item. I agree, yes, I, I remember that, yeah. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, so I wonder if I could have a mover to receive all of these or approve these minutes as circulated. So moved. Morris, thank you. See Joanne seconding. Um, are there any other corrections coming from those minutes or changes you'd like to see? Seeing none, um, all in favor of the motion? Lovely, thank you. Carried. Any um, business arising from the minutes? I didn't uh, see any. Sabrina, was there anything in particular? No? Okay, so we don't. Did anybody else see any business arising they want to bring up? Seeing none, um, I don't believe we need this motion then, do we, Sabrina? Thank you. Um, so communications with the board, there are no deputations scheduled. 
think that's still the case. We have nobody else here to provide any public input to the agenda. Um, there is one piece of correspondence, which is the fall newsletter from the Ontario Library Service. I'm um, wondering if anybody has any questions or something you want to raise about that newsletter. I don't see anybody with a hand up. Okay, uh, in which case, can I ask for a, a mover to receive the correspondence as information? Dorothy? And Andrea, the seconding. Um, all in favor? Opposed? Okay, that's carried. So now we're into the main, um, the gist of the agenda, shall we say. So the first item is the uh, interim, no, oh, it's the action plan 20, the close of year report. And so really, I'm just uh, wondering if there are any questions anything that people need to discuss about this close of year report. Just pointing out that uh, some of the items that uh, were not completed last year are carried forward or will be carried forward into the uh, action plan for this coming year. Okay, seeing no questions on that. Um, let's move on to uh, the next item, the report, the interim Q1 action plan. So this is where you will see some of those ones that were carried over. Um, again, is there any, um, any questions, anything people want to talk about right now? Could we just uh, review those on the board, on the computer screen? Here they come. Thank you. Yeah, there they are. The um, item on the key supporters is something that's been on our action plan for a, a while. And it's something that I think will uh, come out of some of the discussions from our strategic planning process. So that will, that's on for a March discussion. Um, Sabrina, I wonder if you'd comment on the um, ROI and the social value report. Certainly. Uh, so the ROI is one of those that we've been trying to put up uh, to publish and bring to council for 2020 on. Obviously, 2020 happened and things sort of got pushed back. We then wanted to do it in 21. Um, and the um, Ontario Library Service North and Souls had merged and they were sort of in a flux on setting their priorities. So they hadn't updated the template that was being used from the Northern version to the uh, provincial viewpoint. Um, we had hoped that they were going to move that forward to be a release. Uh, since it hasn't happened, we're actually going to be using the study that was done and doing the coding ourselves. Uh, so the coding is all there, it's just in a locked Excel. Uh, so we're going to recode that and use the 2021 statistics uh, to be able to uh, present what the return on investment is. And we hope to have that in um, March or shortly thereafter. Uh, we're just starting our uh, wrap up of 2021 um, information to prepare our annual survey to the province. We'll be using that with our uh, final finance from the town to be able to produce this report. Great. Thank you. All right. I have a question. Great. Morris, go ahead. I'm sorry. Not, not so much a question. Um, the, the item number four, point four there, provide updates to council through committee of whole meetings on a quarterly basis. Isn't, um, I'm wondering if, if, if that actually is a wee bit superfluous since if there was anything we would want to com communicate to, to, to council, we do it on an ongoing basis, either that way or they in fact get the updates through our, um, through the, they're reading our minutes. So I'm suggesting, is that necessary to put that in? I'll, I'll go along with whatever the board thinks, but. 
um, uh, comments. Anybody wish to comment on Morris's question? My, How come the dead sounds? Yeah, my own my own feeling is it's always good to be uh, in front of council from time to time, so they remember us, <laughs> and uh, we're able to keep them up to date on anything that. Uh, not say we have concerns about, but just generally sharing information about the library so that uh, we're um, we're memorable. <laughs> well, I still think they they get enough information, enough paperwork through our minutes. I assume they're reading it, reading them. Mm -hmm. And if there was something came up, if something came up in the month of January, we would communicate it to them in February. We wouldn't wait until March. Would you not agree? Uh, uh, um, absolutely, um, but we may do it by correspondence as opposed to, you know, making a, a brief deputation at council. So you would agree that if there was something that we really wanted them to hear, to see, to feel, that we would get to them one way or the other, wouldn't we? Of course, um, but that often ends up being um, a problem or a concern. It's nice to be in front of council with good news which is the whole point of the quarterly thing. Okay. We have these discussions already. Uh, I'd like to hear from other people. Andrea? Thank you. Through you, the chair, uh, you, uh, uh, Morris, you have a, uh, has provided a good point that your information is very accessible. So not only do, from a council perspective, do we get to review what you send us directly, but it's also very easy to look up information about either events or past meetings, et cetera, on the website because it's kept so up to date. Um, that said, it's not just the audience at council. It's not just the council table, but it's also members of the public that are following the council meeting too. So it is actually another platform or avenue of communication outward into the community as well. And I know that you have a, a good framework in place about how you can also communicate to the public, but just so that, you know, I, I know for when people speak to me that they've been following along on council meetings or the deputations in particular, because there's usually a good wealth of information from whoever is pr presenting a deputation. Uh, so you're reaching more than just the seven people at the council. Anybody else want to comment? Uh, does anyone want to propose a change to the quarterly? Okay, so I think we'll leave it as is. Okay, Morris? It's okay by me. Okay, good. Um, can you go back on? Uh, thank you, Sabrina. <laughs> so this is the, I guess, the second page. Yes, it is. Um, I just wanted to ask about the uh, the boot camp. Uh, I know it says your expected timing is February, but the boot camp is actually February one to five or something of that sort. So whatever decisions we're going to make, we need to make it really this this meeting. And do we have it on the agenda for information about that? I do. Um, I believe it is part of our round table discussions. Okay. Nope, I'm sorry. Uh, it'll be under other business. <sighs> okay, so long as we remember, because this is the opportunity to uh, explain how one participates. And if I forget it, when we get there, please let me know. Um, any other comments or questions about the Q1 action plan, interim action plan? Okay. Seeing none. Now are we, do we need to approve this at all, Sabrina? I see there's not a motion to that effect. <clears throat> uh, we are simply at this point 
listing it as being received. If it is something that we want to approve, since it is an interim plan, we'll be working on the full plan that is the actual 22 moving in the next quarter. Um, this board can approve this as the official quarterly plan if we'd like to do that. Otherwise, it would just be as information. Uh, staff is working through through this list. Okay. Um, so I think we're fine the way we are. Unless okay. somebody wants to move. A, okay, good. Then let us move on. Ah, yes. So this is the main item the, on the agenda, the uh, plan um, working group update from November. Uh, and uh, I guess we will have three of us providing a bit of context for this. So the working group members are myself, Sabrina and Mary. Um, so we are, um, actually, can I ask either Sabrina or Mary to talk about the um, updates, the um, various means of which we've acquired information and uh, the kind of numbers we're seeing there. it looks like we had a pretty comprehensive process. Certainly. Um, Mary, would you like to go through some of the, uh, the aspects on the phases? Thank you. Um, so in phase one, we released our micro surveys, which uh, to date, we've released a total of 12 micro surveys and we've received 368 completed surveys. We also, in phase one, did our community consultations where we were able to talk with 1,114 community members through informal consultation. Phase one also um, included like um, consultations with our staff as well, which was included in our community conversation uh, report. And just want to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. In uh, phase two, we had our uh, post-it note activity where we um, had this activity up for three weeks at both the Craigleith Heritage Depot and the Ellie Shore branches. We were able to receive uh, 2,575 comments by 360 participants. And in the last uh, week, so just uh, beyond those three weeks, we had a soft close where um, both comments, uh, where comments from both branches were merged from November 23rd to 27th, where folks could still um, make a couple comments and provide feedback. In phase two, we also had our focus groups. We had 12 focus groups with 30 attendees. Um, we had uh, themed focus groups. So there we had themed focus groups with seniors, parents, educators. Um, and we also had, um, um, we also connected locally with organizations and associations such as the Blue Mountain Seniors Network, BVO, Senior Center Without Walls, Georgian Bay Youth Roots, and the Agricultural Advisory Committee. And hopefully we'll be uh, meeting with Rotary um, early, early in 2022 this year. We also had in phase two our strap plan drop-ins. So our CEO, Sabrina Saunders, and a board member um, had uh, strap plan drop-ins. Um, there was four uh, drop-ins scheduled, and we had four participants. At, um, and these were held at Ellie Shore and at Craigleith Community Center. In uh, phase two, we also released our report for our community consultations as well, detailing uh, the information that we gathered through community consultations and synthesizing the community feedback that we received from it. And so it's uh, quite an extensive uh, information gathering process that we've done in phase one and phase two. And hopefully um, it has fed our strategic planning process uh, study very well. Great. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions of Mary on that uh, portion? 
seeing none. Sabrina, shall we move on to this uh, presentation you have up on the screen for us? And there we go. Okay, so um, as part of our discussions, I've, I've actually, I've met with Sabrina and Mary, um, and for that matter, Hannah, um, a couple of times on this topic. And I know there was a whole lot more work went into it before I, I came along. Um, so first thing to point out is that we've done a little bit of work on the um, mission and the vision statements. They are not greatly different from the uh, one from the last strat plan, but they are somewhat um, streamlined. And, uh, and oh, in terms of values, we've made no changes there at all. So as you can see, the mission is now the Blue Mountains Public Library. It's a dynamic center of community engagement where everyone can connect, explore, and create. And the vision is our community hubs meet the evolving interests and needs of our diverse and growing population through thriving gallery, library, archive, and museum services. Um, so those were, like I said, they, we honed those down from, uh, with, in mindful of what we'd heard from the community and also the, what we had in the past and tried to hone them in a little bit closer. So is there any uh, questions or comments people want to um, make about those three items? Hey, Lori, if I may, um, have we adopted um, this, the, the phrase community hubs now? Is it different from what we had before? We, um, we were tended to refer to vibrant spaces in our last plan. Um, uh, community hubs is a term that's arisen more recently with the direction and the language the ca uh, council is using. So that's- Do we have uh, a community hub right now? Yeah. Well, Valley we Shore is assumed to be an actual community hub. Uh, that is part of the leisure activity studies report. Um, so as Ellie Shore doing what it's done since 1995, it would still be considered a community hub. Yeah. Do we have any others? The uh, not not at this point, I would say, but the uh, work the council is working on is kind of a, having an eastern hub, um, and in addition to you know the what Sabrina's just said about the Thornbury one, and uh, that's coming out, I guess, in the leisure study and also in their master uh, master plan, and uh, so we're adopting that language because that's also where we see the library, the GLAM as a whole, so is the hub. I'll buy that, no problem. You know, I'm just commenting because the use of the term is, is well, I know it's been around for a little while, but it is new in the, in the, in the, in, in the literature. Mm -hmm. Not everyone reads the town the minutes or the minutes for the town meetings. No, no, of course not, no. Sorry, that was all I had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, just a little bit more context. I just want to be clear that this is the language that we're we're proposing um, as a working group, and from what we've gleaned from the uh, consultation process, and that we'd be looking for approval of these statements in order to take it out to the community for feedback. So, in a sense, it's a you know interim approval, pending feedback from the community. Jesse. Uh, Lori, did, did, did you consider any other word uh, for the word hub? Uh, for example, such as heart or center? Mm. Uh, no. I'm, I'm not saying that I'm opposed to hub. I'm just wondering whether it uh, expresses in broad enough terms what I perceive to be the role of the library. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually a term like uh, community heart works well for me, <laughs> but we were also trying to emulate the, um, some of the town language and the direction that they're moving in. Uh, Gary. Yeah, I think it is quite broad and I agree because it, it does work with the town um, language. I think it's a good concept that we, we keep talking about it. 
but we have to get others um, brought into the fold, if you like, or, or informed a little bit. So I like it. Thank you. Other comments, I, Dorothy? Yeah, I, I like it very much. I think um, Community Hub is very explicit and it's a little more concrete, certainly more concrete than vibrant spaces, which is a little uh, ephemeral for a lot of people. I think Community Hub speaks to the, the number of services and the variety of services that the library offers. So I, I like it and I like it that it, I like that it's uh, succinct. Uh, yes, I uh, I really like uh, Hub um, uh, because in the last two years our our space hasn't been that vibrant. Our online space has been vibrant, but calling a, calling it a hub uh, is very flexible. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, comments anyone wants to make on any of the mission, vision, or value statements? Could we read it again, please? Yes. <clears throat> I think she's going to pull it up. <laughs> okay, there's a center. Can I um, ask for a motion to approve these proposed statements for community feedback? Joanne, moving? Yes. Yeah. And seconder? Okay. Dorothy? Any further discussion? All in favor? Thank you, that's carried. Then uh, back up to that presentation, please, Sabrina. So what makes up our strat plan? Uh, the, first of all, there, we have four underpinning themes of truth and reconciliation, diversity, equity, and inclusion, sustainability, and partnership. And I'd like to ask Sabrina to uh, comment on those or themes? Certainly. So in the report, we do have some brief examples of each of them. Um, the, the purpose of having underpinning themes are it's easy to throw something in as a goal or an objective, but we want these four pieces to be pervasive throughout everything that we do as a way that we interpret the types of things that we're doing. Uh, so when we're looking at our services specifically, we know that we can't do everything ourselves. We don't have the funding to do everything ourselves. We also don't have the mandate to do all of the pieces that our community asks for us. But we can work with others who have the facilities, the resources, the funding, the expertise to be able to work together to bring in, for example, uh, through partnerships, the types of, of programs and services that are needed. Similarly, truth and reconciliation. Uh, we don't want this to be a token goal that we are going to work through truth and reconciliation. We want to be considering this in all aspects of our organization, whether it be the collections that we're purchasing, the types of services that we're doing, who we're partnering with, um, the uh, supports that we provide to uh, through curriculum to our local education programs. So that's why we have these as an underpinning theme. So it really will be how we interpret and react throughout all of these goals and objectives over the four years. Great, thank you. Um, then in terms of the three pillars, this is a bit of a different language and more contemporary strategic planning language. 
And we've named three of them, Community Hubs, Empowering Services, and Organizational Excellence. In relationship to our last plan, really you're seeing vibrant spaces has become community hubs. Um, service excellence, I think, has become empowering services. And then the strategic planning and communications and organizational capacity are folded in together as all elements of organizational excellence. So that's why we ended up with three pillars rather than four. And then we developed goals under each of those for a total of 11. So I wonder if you would fit then to the Um, this uh, is structured quite similarly to the last plan in the sense that we have on one side what the community said and uh, then how are we interpreting that in terms of the goals that we're um, trying to achieve. We also developed a vision for each of those three pillars, this one being to provide spaces to connect, explore and create, which again reflect back to, I guess, that language from the mission, I think that is. Yes, it is. And we attempted to, with the community said, we, we wanted to make sure we, as close as possible, pick the language out that we actually heard. Um, so they, they aren't so much interpretive as, as in fact statements that we heard. And then the goals side of it is, the interpretation that we've put on in terms of where we'd be working towards for the next four years. In your actual uh, report that you received, it also includes um, some examples of possible action um, objectives that would appear in our actual action plan. But in terms of the pieces that we're putting out to the community, this is what we'd be asking them, uh, getting feedback on. I don't know if Mary or Sabrina, you want to add any comment to this particular slide? Uh, no, I think that with community hubs, um, go, going back to something that Jesse had asked the question earlier, community hubs is a term that is understood in library world. Uh, it actually started in about 2007 when the province and the feds came up with a super build fund, which was a... a, a a three-way split between uh, the federal, the province, and local municipalities for major infrastructure. And one of the pieces that they were looking for at that point were that there would be more than one service facility in each building. So you saw a lot of libraries being partnered with uh, arenas or skating rinks or community centers. Um, and it, it really took on an idea that there was a hub for a, a library was taking on so many other aspects. Um, so while council is recently looking at this term of community hubs, it is something that is also quite understood in, in libraries that we do such a variety of work. Um, with us being a GLAM as well, a gallery, library, archive, and museum, we find that people come to our, our facilities for many reasons. Some may be for technology, some may be for art, some people may be for research, some are just coming to read the newspaper and have a cup of coffee, and others are coming for absolutely nothing on a service end, but just to meet other people. And we're seeing that now also, that the places that are kind of safe in the community to go, where you can gather, tend to be in facilities like ours because you don't have the Tim Hortons to sit down and talk or uh, a local restaurant that they're doing those. So community hub certainly is an understood term for libraries um, and will fill in many of those aspects. The other part that this particular pillar looks at um, is I think that second bullet is key. It's not just facility driven. So when we're looking at community hubs, we're saying that wherever we are, the hub is. So if we are doing a activity, uh, an evening, a speaker series, a program at Ravenna Hall, for example, we are making that part of the library hub. If we're at the market on uh, a Sunday and we do activities, we're making that part of our community hub. 
Uh, so it is more than just the facilities and it's looking beyond the bricks and mortar. Laura, if I may? Yes, Laura, <clears throat> jump on. Thank you, Sabrina, for explaining that, explaining this community hubs to me. I'm, I'm a man in the street and I've got this document in front of me and I'm reading develop multi-use spaces at and beyond brick and mortar facilities. I'm going to say, what the heck does that mean? Um, the other, the first one's okay, social cohesion. I'm a little vague in what that actually means, social cohesion. cohesion. Does that mean more use of Facebook? They, they, this is the man in the street talking and looking and reading this now. Technolo technologically connected spaces, that's fairly obvious, but that language is, I hate to say it, but look, it's a little above my head. When I read, the, if I get this document and I'm reading it and I'm sitting at home, I wouldn't know what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm exaggerating there, of course. So, so through you, Chair, I think that the strategic plan you are very right is going to be the higher language, higher thinking where we operationalize it is in our annual action plan. So just like our action plan has, you know, C1 and then a phrase that is a really broad idea, we then put in those five or six or seven action items for the year that makes it real concrete, makes it a smart goal where it's it's something that's measurable, it's achievable, it's happening in a certain time frame. Uh, so I do think that part of your, your concern is accurate. Uh, strategic plan is going to have a little bit more of a, a higher thought process of wrapping your head around it. And then we will turn around annually and operationalize these. So we've, we've only picked the first quarter action plan to kind of wrap up what was left. When a strategic plan is approved, which we assume will be in the spring, we'll then break down and say, how are we going to bring social cohesion in a time of challenge and growth? And we know two examples of pieces that came up regularly was the pandemic and people losing uh, the ability to socialize. And then also the us and them, which predates the pandemic. So who are you? Are you a Craigleith person, but I don't interact with Thornbury? Um, am I a new resident that has not been here and doesn't have contacts? Am I a seasonal person? And, and we've heard so much of the us and them kind of pieces, however those were defined. So that's where all of those comments came in, that we are a community of communities, but how do we make the town of Blue Mountains, an entity where everybody has a place and that we start to surpass some of these, these differences. And who, who this uh, strategic plan is aimed at, is it aimed at the public? Or is it Most definitely not. It's aimed at the types of services, programs and governance that we will provide to the public. So how are we going to provide these types of opportunities are what we're looking at. Why are we not, it's not aimed at the public at, at all? Does well, public... it, it is aimed at the public, but it's how we are going to be working towards these pieces. Um, so we, we can't aim at the public on what they're going to do. We can only provide the opportunities in our settings. You know, you, you watch television and you see an advertising program. It's aimed at the public, isn't it, for a reason, to sell them on something. Generally speaking, I'm simplifying here. If this is at all aimed at the public, it's, it's, it's not selling me on, on anything. I'm the public. I'm the man in the street, and I'm saying, what does all this mean? What, what, it, the language is library language. It's not language that I personally would use every day. I don't know what nurturing special cohesion means. I've got a vague idea, but I, I'm being critical here to make sure we've got the right thing if, we're, if this is coming up for approval. 
And mm. believe me, it probably will come up for approval, but we've got to think of these things. Mm -hmm. One of the um, things we did with the report that went to the board, um, it included a little bit more information than this, than the slides actually have. And the intent of that was to give a more, um, let's see, down to earth uh, examples of what say social nurturing, social cohesion means. Um, so just, uh, I'll just read the, uh, the bullets we included there. Support community well-being while combating isolation, which is a comment that Sabrina made in relationship to everything we're hearing in terms of people you know, being at home a lot. <laughs> um, offer safe gathering opportunities for shared experiences. Uh, provide opportunity for diverse community members to engage with each other. And that's again sort of breaking down some of the, um, someone referred to it, I think it was Mary, as kind of dotted lines in the sand. Uh, there's uh, COVID and our isolation has sort of increased our isolation from each other and brought out many of our differences in a, in a more uh, profound way than many of us would have noticed before. And so part of our goal is to rebuild some of that social cohesion. And so opportunities for diverse community members to engage with each other is, you know, an example of something that would, an objective that would go into our action plan, provide linkages to our community's history and also support our underserved communities. So those objectives were meant to clarify what might sound being to, I don't know, a slightly obscure language in words like nurture social cohesion. There's another phrase for it, Laurie, it's called highfalutin. <laughs> Yes, yes. All I'm saying is, look, I agree with what, you, what you've just described in the detail. The detail, when I read it over, etc., looked fine to me and explained it to me. Explained it to me as the man in the street. You understand what I'm saying? It's the guy in the street who's in for a cup of coffee and he's reading this stuff. But the guy's, he's also reading the first page and he's, he's, he's going to say, what's this stuff? I agree with the nuts and bolts of what you have is great, but is there any way, or maybe I'm way offline, but is there any way we could simplify, possibly take another look at the, 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 the first page? Uh, does anyone else want to comment on Please that? Please do, yeah. Uh, Jesse. Um, I'm inclined to agree with Morris. <laughs> um, I think the, the, uh, the idea is a good one. It's the wording of the message which may not <clears throat> resonate with as many people as we would like. Uh, most of life is a sales pitch. And I think this is a sales pitch. We're trying to sell the value of the library in all of its facets. <clears throat> so I'm just wondering whether we shouldn't have another go at that language. Anybody else? There are any suggestions on adjusting the language, how to adjust the language? Can you put the message, put it back on the screen, please, Sabrina? <clears throat> What does nurture social cohesion mean? Yes. Jesse says things so much better than I, much better than I do. <laughs> um, well, certainly in my mind, and I think the examples which are now up on the screen as well are, are, are aspects of how do you nurture social cohesion or break down uh, barriers, which is much more of a negative way of saying it. Um, you know, bind the community together. <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure, that, that, of course for me that, that, I love that phrase. 
you're breaking my heart. <laughs> but I'm certainly open to uh, clearer language uh, if we can uh, come up with something. Do we have time? The intent would be, has been uh, to release this for community input um, following approval of these pillars and initial goal, uh, goals, yes, um, following this meeting. I mean, so that is another opportunity is to put it out as is, because this is, this is really approval for community input. And then let the community come back and they could say, as you suggest, uh, Morris, you know, what on earth do you mean by nurture social cohesion? And that would certainly tell us that the community doesn't get it either. So we need to do something with it. I see both Joanne and Dorothy with their hands up. So I'll I'm, take I'm, I've been um, <clears throat> racking my brain trying to dumb that down. Um, and then, and, and maybe we're just so sophisticated. Um, and, and maybe in fact, it is up to the community to come up with um, something catchy and easy to say the same thing. I don't know. Uh, Dorothy, I saw your hand up and then Jesse after that. Yeah, I, I'm wondering two things. Uh, I think we could probably, I like nurturing social cohesion. It has a nice flow to it. Perhaps we could say something like encouraging community unity. I just, I, I don't know, as a thought. But secondly, would it help if we had the overriding statement immediately followed by the examples? So nurture social cohesion at a time of growth and challenges by, and then the nuggets that are underneath it. So that people if they're wondering what does that mean, they have examples immediately accessible. So yeah, so for example, um, yeah, so you can say nurture social cohesion, blah, 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 for example, and then just as you say, list those five bullets yeah. underneath and that gives them the context. So the ability to interpret. We could do that right. in a community survey. Yeah, and, and I mean, we could also look at the language, it is, it's great language, might be a bit lofty. I I, uh, I don't know, I, I guess it's worth thinking about. We know what the demographics are. Um, but I think if you have the examples immediately following the statement, it would help people out. Um, and then I saw Jesse's hand and then Gary's. Well, just talking about the word nurture, I understand what the word means. I think a lot of people will, clearly understand it, but I just have the feeling it's just a little bit pretentious and not very much in common usage for the average person in the street. Uh, a, a synonym for that would be encourage or develop or uh, foster even. I mean, there, I'm just thinking about the language which will resonate with a larger segment uh, of our population. I like foster. That, that works for me. Um, then I, but anyway, I have Gary and then Morris. Um, yeah, I agree. You can, you can dumb down the language a little bit or you know, some people are really good at, at editing for the grade level you're aiming at now. I don't know what grade, I don't know what grade level it is. Probably somewhere in high school, I would think. Um, but I think including the example is probably helpful. Uh, I suppose the risk is people will start picking specific items to comment on, which is fine. It's all feedback to us. So I, I think it's good. But to me, it would help explain what we're thinking. But I agree. I think if, if you could make the language even more simplified, that would be great. When I look at even the examples, you get into the library of things. Well, what is that? I don't even know if you have to put the example to the example or terms that we know, like, like creator space. We know what it is, but I'm not sure the public would exactly know what it is. So Wired Wednesdays if you're, you know, maybe we just need something to practice and help a little bit. Or maybe we simplify and just put in 
three three examples in each one. Pick the ones that are the broadest, I suppose, and the easiest to do. Okay. Uh, Melissa, you want to go next? Yeah, thank you, uh, Laurie. Um, coming back to my question, um, quite frankly, I don't see the necessity to finally approve this at today's meeting. If we left this until February or March, the world's not going to fall apart or anything. We're still going to have a, a plan. And I know we, we well, we did sort of do away with committees and we, 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 we have, shall I say, your committee. But if we could devote as a board, there's only six of us, uh, six, six, and, and Serena, seven. Sorry, I was counting there. Um, it wouldn't take, it might be a special meeting, but rather than try and not force through, but come up with suggestions because I raised a doubt in somebody's mind, well, instead of trying to do it today, could we not, table this and come back to it at a later date? Is there is there a necessity that we must pass this today? Because if we don't pass it today, then we reject it. Isn't that true? Uh, not necessarily. Um, we could, uh, you know, we could talk a little bit more about adjusting some of this language. And I, and I see, I think Dorothy put up another suggestion as a chat to everybody. Um, you know, fostering community unity uh, is su her suggestion. Because I don't think it would take much to um, massage some of this language. Um, and rather than simply moving the same discussion to, a, you know, another month from now. So I would rather, unless people want to object to that, I would like to continue with this discussion and try to get at least approval for release to the community before we're done today. Giving a moment for people to object to that. Uh -huh. Okay, so let's uh, continue with the discussion. Um, so I think I've heard, oh, Andrea, see your hand. Thank you. Through you, the chair, I wanted to um, uh, concur with the suggestion about uh, inter interjecting the examples to help illustrate. I, I think that that does make a lot of sense and it does appeal to various different language of explaining the same thing, but giving concrete illustrations, I think would be very helpful. I, I mean, I, I have, I've been thinking through like everybody else, you know, synonym, synonyms to replace cohesion, uh, you know, something like connection isn't quite the same thing because cohesion lends itself to the sticking together part too, you know, and, and then maybe somebody else would say, well, that's lofty of you to say, you know, unity, that sounds rather you know, rather philosophical, you know, really, th th that's not really what I'm looking for when I come to a community hub. So there might be some more wordsmithing. I'm not sure how many of the points that are in the rest of the plan are going to need this kind of discussion too. So I'm not sure if I missed something while I was out rescuing my mom, my mom's car or, <laughs> or what's to follow. But I did think that was a good, a good suggestion to interject with the examples that have been provided. Okay. Um, so let me just do a quick poll. Um, who uh, do we uh, do you agree that we interject the examples under each of the goals? Uh, yes, raise your hand. Okay, so we will definitely do that. Um, I've seen the word foster come through in, in at least a couple of different examples. I'm wondering if we might change the word nurture to foster. If you agree with that, hands up. But okay. at the same time, may I see the, the, the words we're talking about on the screen so I can see what it looks like on paper, well, on the screen yep. uh, as a phrase rather yep. than a word in isolation. Yep, that's fine. Go ahead, Sabrina. I'm not trying to be negative on this. Believe me. I think that someone actually has it open. Possibly Mary. Uh, sorry. Let, let me finish. What I say. I'm not trying to be negative on this. But I think if we're going to do it, we should do it right. 
And if it takes a little longer, so be it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I agree. I just think it might just take a little longer at this meeting without uh, sending it off to another, another meeting, that's all. Uh, so we're having trouble getting that phrase up, are we? Um, Sorry, someone has the file open. I'm just waiting for it to close so that I can get into it. Jesse probably is he's, he's reading something. <laughs> I want to think. <laughs> that would have been a leap in technology for all of us to do that. <laughs> Maybe I'm reading the uh, thesis. Ever think of that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here we are. No, no, I meant the blue thing. Oh, well, it's the same thing. This is the same thing. I think we can, we might be able to edit the document you're looking at now and not be able to edit the blue thing. Uh, okay. Yeah, but but you, you, you're missing my point. The, the blue piece of paper is your introductory document. That's the thing you read first. And that's the one that we should be focusing on. If, if we're putting these, these examples in, they've got to go on the blue page, or I call it the blue page at this point. Uh, well, that PowerPoint presentation is actually a presentation to the board. It's not a presentation to the community. Uh, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. We, uh, the way the community will be seeing it, it will be through a survey. And, and yes, and when we actually move to presenting the full document to the public, it will be the extensive document that we have online with all of the examples. Uh, this was for the board to look at it at a very high level, uh, to make decisions on the, the wording before we go to the public. Um, and as for putting it to the public and then looking for us to change it later, I would recommend to the board that although it doesn't have to be finished and approved today, Lori is right, our chair is right, to try to get as much of it in a working group now. If we have to bring it back again, we can. But I would definitely be cautious about saying, put it to the public and then bring it back and want to change it. Because then what's the point of giving feedback to the public? Mm -hmm. If we put it to the public, we should be comfortable that whatever the public says at that point, we accept it regardless. Um, so if it's a case where you're not happy with the wording now, we want to make sure that we're putting something out to our public to make final feedback that you would be happy to accept. <clears throat> Couldn't agree more. Okay. Um, so uh, I think it's good. I think it flows. You know, people don't get too caught up on the broader goal typically. I think the word nurture does kind of, if you change that one to support or whatever we're talking about, all the rest are, are, are solid, like develop, survive, divide. Uh, I don't have an issue with them, but I, I, and I think the examples um, that people say we shouldn't expand computer access, we don't expand computer access, right? But I think the examples are, are, are tight enough that it will be helpful to us. Um, so I see you've changed. So can you delete the word nurture and you're trying to make it visible to us, thank you. So if we change foster, Change nurture to foster, we'd have foster social co cohesion in a time of growth and challenges. Um, is foster the only word? That's, well. Remote is a word. What about foster and encourage? Uh, uh, whoever that was didn't agree. Um, <laughs> If I may, Madam Chair, as we're looking at our action verbs, I think we also have to be aware that we have to achieve the verb. So encouraging yeah. or developing, um, develop, we can't develop social cohesion. You can't develop somebody else to do something. We can provide the environment, which is fostering, which is nurturing. So we do want to just make sure that as we're looking at our action verbs, um, which in this case, this word is, would be foster. Uh, let's just make sure that our, our team through governance, staff and partnerships can achieve that action. 
which I so think we could is, say encourage or support. I'm okay with foster. Just I um, want to make sure we all understand that there are other words which might be equally acceptable. Encourage is a synonym for foster, which is a synonym for nurture. All in. <laughs> okay, so we have um, both foster and encourage on the table. Uh, can I ask people to tell me which they prefer? I'm going to put foster out there first and put your hand up, please, if you prefer foster over encourage. So prefer foster over encourage. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, I don't think I need to ask the encourage question. Um, so does that work for people? We say... We, we change that to foster and then we add examples. Uh, Morris, you also said you didn't understand or you questioned the develop multi-youth spaces at and beyond brick and mortar facilities. And I think you're, you're right, it's a bit, the wording's a bit odd, but again, the examples probably explain what that's about. Yes, it, it, it does now when I put them side by each, uh, side by, uh... Yes, hey, together. <laughs> together. Thank you. I thought I was in Newfoundland there for a moment. <laughs> um, Gary, I see your hand up. What you could maybe say there is develop multi use physical and electronic spaces. Whoa. Um, actually, I, I, it's going to be a bit buzzy. So. Yeah. And it wasn't necessarily technology as well, it was also about expanding. Um, uh, Sabrina's example was, for example, using the Ravenna Hall as a location which we would deliver services to a different part of the community without it being a, a, a new physical bricks and mortar. It's a facility that already exists. Am I right, Sabrina? Is that? Yeah, that's how I, how I remember that discussion. So while it's a bit odd, it's really trying to get at a couple of different types of concepts. It seems to me that if you leave it in the way it is, people are going to read it once. Like people like me are going to read it once. They're going to say, well, I don't know what that means. But then I'm going to jump to the suggestions. And I'm going to be happy. Or the uh, examples, I mean. I'm going to be happy. Okay. Great. Um, so can we move on? Any other discussion on this, on this community? Oh, Gary, sorry, I didn't. One, one last crack at it. Why not just say develop multi-use spaces? You could say with community partners if you want. Because the examples are, are good. Um, so develop multi-use spaces, and what was the rest of it? Well, you could leave it there, or you could say with community partners, because obviously it's, it's their own, and it's also beyond. It's with other other people. So open for hmm. it's really a, it's a physical location. You're right, it's not electronic at all. It's a, so why not just say develop multi-use spaces with our part? I think we were trying to be clear yeah. that it's it's not just bricks and mortar. Maybe it's oh, I don't know. I know it's a bit obscure the language. I'm wondering if the examples solve the problem and we're okay with it. I, I, now that I've read it a couple of times, I, initially I was crystal clear and now I'm getting foggy. <laughs> um, <laughs> I hate when that happens. <laughs> what is a multi-use space that is not physical? Well, I'm going to let Sabrina tackle that one. I think when we're looking at the physical spaces, we have two aspects that we're looking at. First is not every facility that we are going to do services in is going to be tied to our locations. So it isn't just Craigleith Heritage Depot. It isn't just Ellie Shore. 
So there may be other physical locations that you think of like Ravenna Hall, like churches, um, a parks that won't necessarily be our facilities. Uh, the other piece is when we're being asked for services being provided in community um, settings, especially rural settings, we're going to be looking at outreach that may not have anything to do with the building. For example, we were doing outreach by meeting people at mailboxes <laughs> because there's areas of our community that don't have a building. There's, there's areas that, you know, if somebody says, where do you live? They don't say I live in Craigleith or Thornbury. They say I live in Northwinds. I live in Windfall. I live, it's, it's a community that doesn't actually have a community center because it's, it's divisional. Um, so in those cases, we could be doing something in a quad or a square or again at, you know, the local school drop off for the buses for our elementary or secondary students. So it is a case of not just our bricks and mortar, not just bricks and mortar that currently exist in the community, but many multi-use uh, sites that you might not think of for services. And then of course, there's the entire aspect of what the town wants to do with the future of our facilities, which is including a new multi-use site on the East End, um, how Ellie Shore is slated for renovations and expansion. So it ties into both the current facilities, other facilities across our community and places that we wouldn't even consider as being facilities. Okay, thank you. No, I am like Dorothy, excuse me. I'm, I'm just as much confused. I know what a brick and mortar, mortar situation is. You're implying you'd, 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 we'd be doing something out in the field someplace? We could be. If where people tell us they want things is where we are trying to bring. So part of what we're trying to do is to be where people live, work, and play. Um, and when somebody says that they would like something in Heathcote, there's no facility for us to go to in Heathcote. We're going to where people are asking us to be. And in some cases, it's the, um, you know, the, the drop-off area parking lot for the canoe area. And that's where we're running a program. Yeah. Madam Chair, may I just suggest, that, that leave that phrase as develop multi-use spaces, make it period. Develop multi-use spaces, period. Let people figure out what that means themselves, because they're going to look at the examples. We could go on for days, well, not days, but we've gone for hours arguing about this, this, this particular thing. I'm wondering if something a little bit simpler, how about develop multi-use GLAM spaces and expand oh. services in rural settings? Yeah, you're coming oh. down to, yes, that's good. Excuse me. Uh, Joanne, I see you. Um, I, I just like um, develop multi-use spaces because when you said rural settings, I, I know that Mary met uh, with um, um, citizens at the um, market. That wasn't rural, but it's just a space. Why does it have to be a rural space? <laughs> Yeah, this is getting crazy. First of all, I, I have to um, commend you three women who uh, put so much work into setting this up. And I'm, I'm uh, quite frustrated tearing it apart word by word uh, when I know how much work went into it um, with respect to uh, um, other members. But um, I'm, I'm getting ticked off. No. <laughs> okay. Um, Gary. Yeah, I like the idea of just stopping at the multi-use spaces, but you could also say develop, you're saying develop, develop multi-use spaces, and you could say and provide outreach spaces, if you think that makes it more clear. If not, I would just stop it at uh, develop multi-use spaces and let people tell us what they are. Okay. So. We have two suggestions on the table. Uh, develop multi-use spaces, period. 
And we have second option, develop multi-use spaces and provide outreach services. Which I'm sure we're intending to do anyway. Um, yes. Uh, so who wants to stop at develop multi-use spaces uh, versus develop multi-use spaces and provide outreach services? So the first one, who wants to develop multi-use spaces, period? That's me. I see uh, Joanne and Morris and Jesse. And who wants to add and provide outreach services? And that's four of us. So we're doing the and provide outreach services. Everyone okay? So can that's I see that on the screen? So that's, so develop multi-use spaces and provide outreach services. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna ask, are we okay now with community hubs, this, this section? Okay, and let's move on to the empowering services one. And in this case, we have also the vision of creating a service model that reaches those who live, work and play in the town of the Blue Mountains. And our three goals, provide diverse GLAM services, collections and programs support 21st century literacy through resources, opportunities, and coaching, and expand the virtual branch. Any comments, questions, things you want to see changed? And again, with this one, we would move the examples in to the actual, with the goal, so people have a better concrete understanding of what it means. Oh, there, Jesse, sorry. <laughs> Question for the chair. If you stopped 100 people at random on the street, how many of them would know what the word glam means? Uh, probably not that many, but um, we have put in a definition, whatever we've mentioned that in brackets, glam is our gallery, library, archive, museum. So it's, it's uh, out there for them. Uh, earlier on, you mean? Um, the definition. Well, uh, in the case of this particular thing, we actually <laughs> we actually included it right uh, in that box. Mm, that didn't help. Uh, so it's where we used it. Yeah, I saw that. Um, yes, yeah, so we're trying to keep it close to where we're using it, so people start seeing it more. Okay. Is that fair, Sabrina? Yeah, okay. Correct. Okay, empowering services. Anybody have any what, things they want to suggest in terms of changing language there? Could you put it back up, Sabrina, please? Is um, 21st century an important descriptor for literacy? It's um, meant to suggest not like lots of different types of literacies. Um, yeah, so I guess that's true. There's, yeah. yep, math literacy. Yeah, yeah, okay. Technology literacy. I mean, maybe we need to make literacy plural. Oh. That, uh, does that help at all, making literacy plural? I was happy with the word literacy. Yeah, I, I'm okay with it too. It's just... Okay. I'm good with it. It's okay. And again, the examples will help to clarify. They suggest health, financial, yep. legal, technology. <clears throat> um, 
Are we okay then with, did I miss somebody? Matt, Gary? Can we just do a little descriptor for creator space? Um, I, I'm surprised when you said that people may not be familiar with that because we've, it's been in the library now for some time and uh, I, my impression would be it'd be a fairly common phrase now. Anybody else want to comment on that? Any sense that it's known or we, do we need to add more information? Well, to me, it's a word like hub. I think if you just explain in a few words what it does, I think it instructs people. I don't think a lot of people, other than the ones who use it, know it. They love it. But I, I don't think that the average person would have a knowledge about it myself. Morris? Uh, it, it's interesting that a library board member, this is not meant as a criticism, but it's interesting that a library board member would, in effect, say, well, what do you mean by creator space? What do you think the guy in the street's going to say? Gary, did you have any ulterior motive for, for bringing no, no, that no, up? I, I know what it is, and I, I just want to get people to explain what it does in a few words. In, in, English, in, in English, in common language. Yeah, just, just say what yeah. it does. That's good. That's the point that I made before. You're not speaking to the to the man in the street. You're not speaking to the guy having a beer over a over a having a beer. Period. Yeah, you know what that is, but we're not explaining what it what it is. Yeah. So in the example, we could put it. So offer creative space sessions in 2022. Um, in bracket, you know, e.g., use of the big movie camera thing. <laughs> <laughs> it has a name that I can never remember. Well, we know a lot. Of it. <laughs> uh, I think Sabrina's typing madly away. <laughs> I, I think we're just trying to help inform or educate. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, edit. Edit. So mine is really tiny on my screen. So perhaps, Sabrina, you can read that when you're done. I'm just going to refresh my water. I won't be far. I have used some video videography equipment and how to editing sessions. Does that work? Even on the how to, do, is, it, is yeah. it music as well? Yeah, that's good. I'm back. Yeah, etc. Do you like it, Gloria? At uh, use of the big uh, tell the uh, big. Uh, for photography machine? I think this works a bit better. Okay. Yep, I think so. Okay, how are we doing on this section? Uh, do you want Good. workshops after the Enhanced Wired Wednesday and Tech Help Workshops? Add the word workshops. Yep. Again, I know mean, oh, there's also one on one available, but I think that's fine. Is there any possibility that um, you might drop Wired Wednesday at a later date over the next four years? As a name? Uh, well, as a, as a uh, whatever you call it, a program. No, I'm saying if you're putting something in there and then you don't have it for sale in two years' time, you're not doing exactly right. I mean, can but you- These are examples and it would be something that we would be putting into the 2022 action plan. So we don't know what the 24 or 26 action plan is. Um, and we'll write that in that year. All right, that's no, not a big deal. It's hard to say what our examples would be outside yeah. of 22, because the whole point is with a strategic plan, we have to be specific enough to have a guide, but flexible enough that we can achieve it with the needs of the community at that particular time. So, we, so we're okay for somebody to come back in three years time or something and say, well, you said you're gonna put this in there, but you're not doing it. We're right, okay with because that. we didn't actually say that we're gonna put that in there. We said that we're gonna provide 21st century literacies through resources, opportunities, and coaching. And how we do that will be based on what the needs are of the community every single year. Okay, all right. 
Anything else on empowering services? Good. <laughs> okay, so then let's move on to organizational excellence. And the vision here is to grow uh, BMPL as a key partner and community resource. And in this case, we have two, four, five um, goals. Do you mind my asking what the word stewardship means in this context? I think it means what it normally means is being a, a good, um, I'll use the word trustee of public money and public services. It does. So we're demonstrating our, through account, transparency and accountability, we're demonstrating that we are um, working in the interest in, of the community with care for the expenditure of tax dollars. Fiscal responsibility, in other words. Mm, certainly it's fiscal responsibility. I think it, stewardship goes a bit beyond that. Did, um, Dorothy, were you going to say something? I thought no, I heard. No, no, I, I agree. It's it's beyond financial accountability. It's, oh, no, I know it is. Yeah, I know it is. But what yeah. is it? Uh, I, I personally, I think it's demonstrating care and commitment to the well-being of the community through the delivery of library services. I would also add, uh, Madam Chair, that with stewardship, not only is it the service model and then the financial accountability, but also how we um, how we source our materials, how we treat our facilities, um, how we work within our own brand, and uh, how we work with the community to be able to keep that brand at a level that people expect. So there's there's a lot of aspects when you're looking at stewardship of a non-for-profit. Hmm. Gary? I just wonder if the word public needs to be in there somewhere. Uh, demonstrate public stewardship through or demonstrate stewardship through transparency and accountability to the public? Is public stewardship different from stewardship? I, I don't think so, but I think we're aiming at the public. Um, this one more particularly, I, I, I just wonder, it, it, it resonated well with me. Uh, it's just not required, but I just thought it um, was trying to be very public in demonstrating it to um, uh, thoughts from anybody else on adding public ahead of stewardship? Well, my only comment would be it's, it's no more clear. <laughs> stewardship and public stewardship mean the same thing to me. They don't mean anything. What about if it were at the end of the sentence? Who's the public? Well, thoughts on that? Oh, Derry, did you say something again? I, I'm having trouble hearing you sometimes. Sorry. I'm just saying, um, forget the public stewardship. What about demonstrate stewardship through transparency and accountability to the public? And are we demonstrating stewardship to the public or are we doing it to our stakeholders? Because we have others, I wouldn't consider council to be the public. And yet they're the ones who entrust us with the facility and the budgetary allowances. I would see them as a stakeholder as well as all of our community members. So it's just a question if we wanna use stakeholders over public. 
So it would say something like demonstrate stewardship through transparency and accountability to stakeholders. Not sure whether two is the right word, maybe it's with or for, for stakeholders. Morris? If I may, how about as a suggestion, to put these words in, demonstrate transparency and accountability, period. Agreed. Yes, did you said to say agreed? I said I agree. You agree? Okay. Uh, other comments? I'm good with that. Anybody uh, disagree with removing stewardship? Too pretentious. <laughs> I, I'm fine with removing stewardship, but I think demonstrate transparency and accountability is kind of, of, of what? In the management of the library? Um, Implied. I actually like the word uh, stewardship because I think it uh, is a very important concept and I believe it's part of our yeah. values as well. Um, and it's about being a public board um, working in the interests of the public as opposed to uh, self-interest. We are working in the interest of the public if we are demonstrating transparency and accountability. If in fact we are transparent and account accountable. Is that okay. right, right word? So Shall we, okay, I'm gonna pull removing the word stewardship and through. So would, this phrase would be demonstrate transparency and accountability. So it, all those in favor of removing the word stewardship through those two words. Hands up. Morris. Okay. Um, then at this point, we're leaving them in. Does anyone not want to propose something else? So um, right now we have demonstrate stewardship through transparency and accountability. Um, I'm going to move on, leaving it like that, unless I hear somebody else uh, jump in. Okay. Um, so other items under organizational excellence, any suggestions for changes? Okay. Going, going, Dead. gone. Um, so we've made um, some edits. And so I'd like to propose the motion that the board approve the proposed three strategic pillars and 11 goals uh, as Revised, I guess. Including examples for each goal for community feedback. Let's give uh, Sabrina a chance to put that up on the screen. And Gary, I saw your hand. I would move it. Oh, okay. Sabrina, are you trying to get that on the screen for us? Yes. Thanks.
I think I'd have to add the word goal for each goal. I think. So what we have that, that this board approved the proposed three strategic pillars and 11 goals for community feedback as amended and to include, hmm, hang on a second. Okay, let's do that this board approved the proposed three strategic pillars and 11 goals as amended. And then maybe put in brackets and to include examples for each goal for community feedback. Gary, are you okay with that as the mover? Exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> May I have a seconder? I got a question. Uh, yep. Okay, I see Andrea seconding it. And uh, any other discussion, Morris? Yeah, uh, really a question. Is that one motion? I read two. Uh, we've Is already it? passed the one above it, the one on mission, you mean? Uh, no, that this board approved the yeah you know, mission, vision, and value statements. We've approved that. Yeah, we did that yeah. earlier. Yeah. Okay. Well, sorry. It's the way it's written, the way Sabrina has it on the screen here. Um, we're just looking at the one she's highlighted. Yeah. That, that's. Thank you. Uh, that's what we're we're looking at. That's the proposal. Uh, may I still ask a question? Um, of course. It's for you're looking for community feedback. Uh -huh. Could could you just please elaborate on the timing of this whole thing? Um, yeah. Assuming it's gone today, you know. Uh, yes, yeah, so it would be um, put through a community survey to really be released following this meeting and closing at the end of February. And then we would bring that um, data and information back to the March board meeting. And then we would, the working group would produce a comprehensive report um, which, assuming all final data is returned in support of the draft pillars and goals by the April meeting. And we're also in the process of um, drafting the actual plan that would be released to the public, which you would see. Um, I think that would be at the April meeting, if uh, all goes according to the current timelines. And, uh, and also a smaller um, kind of executive summary version that would be released in, you know, I don't know, spring. Uh, thank you. That, that, but tell me, what does the public get within the next week or so? Uh, Is that, that be, whole document we've been looking at? No, they would be getting... Um, Sabrina, can you show a, a quick uh, view of the draft survey? I I'm know asking this question so people to clarify what people are voting on. Right. I, I can't pull up the survey on this screen. Okay. Uh, we're tied to another computer with that one. Uh, but the survey uh, will probably go out tomorrow. It's already in draft. I just need to now go and make those edits that we've uh, we've done specifically to put the comments in as well. Um, so that will go out and it will be a survey asking for feedback on each individual piece. So a question having to do with the mission, a question having to do with the vision, a question having to do with our pillars, and then each goal is a separate question with does it resonate with people? Is there adjusted wording that they would uh, recommend? Is it not something that they see of value? Basically, is this what you told us and what we heard, and now we're giving it back to you? How many questions would be on that survey? Shouldn't take more than about 15 minutes to complete. Um, I believe we have about uh, 12 questions in total. So if somebody wanted to make full out comments, uh, because it does have like the selections that you can do a yes, no, and then make edited pieces. If somebody was just saying no or just saying yes, it's a quick survey. If you wanted to rewrite an entire goal or provide a pillar that they think we've missed, you could spend as much time as you chose to. Uh, but it won't be an extensive amount of time. The intention is for people to be able to uh, read it and make a decision if it's something that makes sense to them and resonates or not. And then give opportunities to say you've missed something. 
Thank you. What, if I may, Madam Chair, this is, this is difficult because the original intention would have been to do the typical town hall like we did in 2018. We presented the plan, we had everybody on site, we had some people make some comments. Um, there were about 15 or 20 people that actually show up to a town hall on, uh, on a good day. Uh, based on our survey responses, we've gotten significantly more responses than what we would have gotten from a town hall. So although this is the reason for doing it is based on the pandemic, I do believe we'll get more feedback by doing a survey than having the one hour town hall where we present it and ask for face-to-face -face feedback. Or at least that's the way it's been throughout this process. Yes, yeah. Um, any other discussion on the motion on the floor? In which case, um, I'd like to call the question. Um, all in favor? Uh, <laughs> Dorothy waving in the background. Okay, that was carried. Thank you very much. I know that was a bit of a <laughs> bit of a long discussion, but thank you for bearing with me through that. Um, so I'd like to move on to the uh, next item on the agenda, which is the um, uh, organizational capacity reports. And uh, I just have a brief um, report I'd like to give. Um, having been elected of uh, as chair at the November meeting, I um, reached out to Mayor Soever and uh, as a new chair of the board and asked to have a chance to get together and um, just really get acquainted and talk. And so we had a coffee um, early in December and um, had a very nice conversation. I quite enjoyed it. And uh, I, um, we'll come back to that later on. Um, I also attended the town uh, committee of the whole meeting on December second where the discussion of the salary survey uh, came up and that was um, also part of the um, the budget process Two hours. and then um, I attended the memorial for Rob Potter on December 3rd at the Marsh Center um, and and very glad I, I did it was a very um, very very well attended very moving speeches and boy he had an interesting taste in music <laughs> Um, I also met with um, Andrea on December 17th. Again, it was a get acquainted over coffee in Thornbury. And then we had a more formal meeting on January 10th to do an orientation session so that she'd be able to land at this meeting with, um, with her feet slightly damp anyway. <laughs> um, and then Sabrina and I met on January 6th to plan the January board meeting. And of course, I've been continuing my participation in the strategic um, planning working group. So that's all I wanted to say about that. And then um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But otherwise we can move on to the next agenda item, which is the Respectful Workplaces Compliance Report. So I'll ask Sabrina to comment on that as well as on the um, Continuous Improvement Report. I'm just pulling that one up for you. I now have so many files open. There we go. All right, so our first one is our uh, workplace violence and uh, compliance report. This is something that comes to the board every January. Uh, that's when we try to pull it forward to you. Sorry, it's not wanting to pull up on me here. There we go. Uh, so this is something that is intended to look at all of the aspects of potential workplace violence that could happen on, on site. Um, our eight areas are what the board has identified as being the key areas that you wanted me to report on annually. This does not take the place of me presenting to the board on any individual situation. And of course, there is no privacy information in this. It's just an overall view of the types of things that we've had. 
Um, this year was better than 2020 and 21 when it came to uh, the COVID issues that we've had, but we've still had at least four major issues with people um, complaining about our, our procedures. Um, again, mask bylaw is in place. We enforce that. Um, our um, COVID uh, requirements come from the ministry and our health unit. We enforce that. We're required to do contact tracing. We enforce that. Uh, and many people find that either a civil liberty issue or they feel that it is um, uh, over blown and it's not really a pandemic and there's other reasons for that. So we, we do have issues that we have to deal with that. Um, more concerning to me is not the four cases where we, you know, we have to have somebody leave the building, threaten to call police, those types of things. It's the microaggression that comes with the everyday activity that staff are dealing with. And we know that everybody uh, who is in a customer service uh, area right now is really being taxed when it comes to behavior of people complaining to our staff, not realizing the toll that it takes on a staff person to have to just keep pushing through and hear the same thing over and over again. Um, so those would be the people who are um, less of an aggression and more of, um, you know, just making ongoing comments about, you know, why do we have to have masks? Don't you know that it doesn't work? Um, and they have to argue the policy again. They have to pol argue the, the health rules. Um, and there is no staff person working in the town of Blue Mountains who is prepared to argue the science. We do what we need to do because we've been told to do it. And it is something that we're going to follow. Um, a lot of people making comments about being, you know, us being the Gestapo because we do that. So that does play a toll on staff on an eight hour shift that they're constantly getting that. And what we're finding over the pandemic is not only the toll that stress is playing on an individual from one event, but now we're at 20 plus months of these events growing and the overall health and welfare of individuals and the burnout rate uh, is something that is um, needing to be looked at for workers and mental health. So that's why I bring that in there. Uh, recommendations, obviously we are working with staff. Um, there are times when I or somebody else will come out on the desk to handle a situation. Uh, if you can tell that they are kind of at a point where they need a moment, you know, you offer that cup of coffee and somebody else takes the desk to really try to give everybody the time to um, let, their, let themselves get to a, a healthy place so they can continue to support the uh, patron who's behind. Um, EAP is available to all of our staff as well. Um, another issue that we've had, uh, this actually has been a much better year for mental health situations in the building. We've only had one individual patron that we've had uh, several incidents with. Um, if you remember from previous years, we often have more than one person that is, uh, is a, a difficult situation to work through. Um, and this particular uh, mental health situation is a person who is concerned about contact tracing, uh, has um, not provided any of their information, um, is using our facilities not as a card holder, so the staff does not necessarily know information, um, you know, and has gone through many situations where they have given false names, including deceased members of the community who have been in the paper, uh, which is another issue that was quite difficult for staff to know that somebody that they knew was being used in that way. Um, so we have worked with the individual. Um, uh, the most concerning situation was when the person was so upset that they ate an apple, chewed up all of the parts, and then threw the apple into all of the bags that children were coming to pick up for Halloween. Uh, so we had to go and you know do some reparative work on children's programming kits um, and also invite the person to leave. Um, what's a difficulty and something that our staff really do pride themselves in is we don't want to kick out somebody who has a mental health issue. There are enough barriers in their life that we don't wanna be one of them, but we also need to protect the other patrons. So when the individual is yelling at children, is yelling at other patrons, is yelling at staff, 
we do have to remove them, uh, but then we invite them to come back and try again tomorrow. Um, it's a kind of a more pleasant way of asking somebody to leave, uh, but we do know that sometimes things happen when you ask a person to leave. Uh, but we've done our best to really not have to get into a no trespass with anyone who's a mental health uh, matter because we don't want to be a further barrier to them. Uh, so again, debriefing, uh, we've threatened to call the police if activities continued. Uh, it has subsided, but you know, in another week, the person may come in and be in another uh, situation again, because mental health is not about us, it's about them, and they bring wherever they are on that particular day into our public setting. So that's all that I have on those, unless there are actual questions. So I do have a question. I'm wondering, Sabrina, um, two things. One, is there anything, any action the board needs to take? It's the first one. And also I was wondering about any kind of signage you've put up in terms of obligations of people coming into the library and their behavior. Um, honestly, I don't know if there's anything that the board can do. The most impactful piece that happened to support us is when council passed the mask bylaw, uh, because then it was no longer a case where uh, ministry had made recommendations. We had a clear directive from our council that as a uh, council owned public facility that we could require masks. Um, in 2020, we did have a number of people who it seemed everybody in a family had a medical exemption and we had to deal with those types of things. Um, now we've gotten further through this that uh, a lot of those situations have resolved themselves. Um, now it's just, you know, the few cases that still every once in a while want to make their voice known. Um, I, I'm, I know even just watching council meetings, the amount of deputations that have come to council has really dropped off. People have kind of given up and become more complacent with it. Uh, I think the biggest fear and concern by staff would be at whatever point the current Town of Blue Mountains bylaw expires or is rescinded, how that will happen. So wanting to make sure that in fact that bylaw does not disappear before we are through a pandemic and a safety issue. And I, I believe that council is on board with maintaining that um, throughout this process because they're, you know, we, we've seen outbreaks in staff from many places. We don't want to put a health and safety matter in. And the, the biggest issue is if our staff become unsafe, we have to close our buildings because then it's health and safety versus public access. And we have to maintain health and safety for our staff primarily, according to uh, Ministry of Labor. And then we have to maintain our health regulations for the public that are coming in as the secondary, but very close secondary piece. So at this point, I don't think there's anything for the board to do other than be aware that it is an ongoing matter and uh, stress levels in all fields are, are definitely heightened and we have to continue to provide uh, the health and safety breaks that we're doing. Would it be of any value for the board to pass the motion commending the staff for their dedicated customer service throughout the challenges of the pandemic as a moral support to them? Certainly. In which case I'd like to move that, um, that the board commend the staff for their dedicated customer service throughout the challenges of the pandemic. Client. Did, I heard a boy, um, Joanna, are you seconding that? A, a, a client, patron, not a customer. Dedicated um, client service, is that what you're suggesting? Or, or patron, uh, whatever, yeah. Whatever dedicated the correct service. word is. How about just dedicated service? Yeah. That's fine, yes. I'm happy with that. Would everyone care to second the motion? I will, Lori. Morris, thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Carried. Um, and I guess my other question has been in terms of signage. So it, it, do, do I understand then that uh, as part of the signage, it's clear that uh, 
about the mask uh, and that this is not, this is a, a, a mandate from the town. Um, yes, we do have the town's bylaw uh, sticker uh, at oh, all of our front okay. doors that the town provided. So we are using that. Thank you very much. So the next uh, report, continuous improvement. Yep. Our second report is our continuous improvement. This is our health and safety document. Um, and unless there are actual questions about it, I'll just briefly say that 21, uh, we did achieve our goals. There were 18 of them. Um, you know, no joking when you say the first one is that nobody dies on the job. We do always want people to be healthy, uh, but we also look at health as being a much broader aspect of not only physical health, but mental health, um, having a, a level of enjoyment in your, your building and your experience so that you don't take something home is a, a big aspect of mental health. Um, so we were uh, successful in the 18 goals that were identified last year. Um, two additional successes, obviously we worked within our terms of reference of the health and safety. And then we had a, we successfully managed COVID-19 pandemic in 2021 without any incidents. So without anybody testing positive, I will let you know that uh, 22, we have already had some uh, members of our staff who have um, either tested positive or have um, been on self-isolation. Uh, we know that uh, Omicron is definitely a, a different situation than previous waves. Um, nothing that is considered an outbreak and all of our staff have been uh, maintaining themselves and working from home where they can. And part of that is changing our model right now that we're trying to limit the number of people in the building from a staffing so that we're doing more things at home uh, so that we don't have as much crossover of staff. So if somebody does become uh, ill, not that they contracted it in the workplace, it could have been when you go to Zares, um, but then there's more opportunity to keep our building open so they can self-isolate but wouldn't have potentially contaminated with others. Uh, we do have a very strong health and safety practices here as well as cleaning and we do take that quite seriously both for staff and for our public safety. Other than that, we have 19 items that we are looking to do this year, uh, one of which has already been achieved. Uh, we have just brought in an AED uh, into Craigleith Heritage Depot, uh, something that we've been requesting uh, for a number of years, and we just took it out of some of our budget from 22 at the end of the year. Um, I know we've had comments that it's a small building, why do you need an AED? How many people actually come through the building? But not only is it a health practice for people in the building, but we find there are many people who come to our building for first aid assistance when they are walking on the trail and they're overheated or they're at uh, the park across the way and their sunstroke and heat stroke and uh, winter levels have, have put them in jeopardy. Uh, so our staff do provide some of that uh, first contact before maybe 911 would be called. So it is a, a good addition. And like every other uh, building uh, that is council owned, the hope is that we never have to use an AED, but if you do, it'll be present on site. Good. Any questions on this report? Uh, seeing none, thank you, Sabrina. Um, then we're moving on to the um, agenda and multi-year agendas item, item four here. And so you can see uh, from the edited version that came out, uh, the changes that are being proposed to this um, policy. So we were anticipating <laughs> the uh, community hubs, empowering services and organizational excellence. Um, basically those items are structuring our agenda because it's around our pillars. So that's that proposal. I think those, the other things are things that happen. Um, we are just updating the 
a standard agenda to reflect what we're already doing, frankly. <laughs> and then uh, we made some adjustments um, to the annual and multi-year month-to-month um, -month agendas. The only change that I was proposing beyond what we'd already seen is in May, which is a little bit further down, is uh, year three and year four uh, mission, vision, values, and mandates, and the year four one new policies required for accreditation and new strap plan. I think those have actually been moved up into April, and we just forgot to delete them here. So I'd be suggesting that we delete those two because they're up up now. Um, any uh, questions or comments? Uh, in which case, I'd like to get a mover and a seconder to approve the amendments to the agenda and multi-year agendas, which is policy 2018.99. So move. Morris, moving. Second, please. Jesse? All in favor? Um, and there goes, <laughs> and there Dorothy just appeared. Okay, that's carried, thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda, well, we don't have a report under Vibrant Spaces. No. The uh, service excellent, we have the CEO's uh, update for January. So I'll put that over to Sabrina, please. Certainly. So uh, as usual, we've collected our statistics. This is for the month of November and December, since we didn't have a, uh, a meeting in December where, where we reported November. Um, I would assume that these will be very close to the statistics that we report as the end of year. Uh, we haven't gathered up all of our information, so we may find some things grow a bit here or there um, or get adjusted. So think of it as sort of the unaudited type bit, um, but we will get those uh, to you soon when we're ready for annual report time. Uh, gallery is quite busy. We've been actually having uh, tours happening on Saturday. Uh, at this point, it's no more than five people at a time, uh, but the artist has been coming for two hours on Saturday and kind of walking and talking with people about his artwork, which has been a really interesting way of handling our gallery without doing a reception. Uh, obviously, receptions are not something we can do at this point. Um, our COVID restrictions, I, I highlighted um, today, the province did just open, um, uh, announce some of the reopening pieces. Uh, but at this point, we are still at 50% limit. This is the first time we've been cut in numbers. Uh, the five maximum is for programs and events. Um, as a result, it made more sense since museums were asked to close and we could only do 50% um, that we shut down the CHD for this portion. Based on the announcement today, uh, January 31st is when the reopening is scheduled to happen. I will warn you that there is a lot of time between now and then. Um, although I do think that the province is going to do it based on everything being set for 21 day periods and two key uh, milestone dates that they have are family day and March break. So I believe that we will probably see those, those dates happen regardless. Um, but if that happens then the CHD will be opening on the 31st. Um, I just want to reiterate that we do not require passporting to enter our buildings. There's some confusion about that. Um, we've had some people come in very upset that we are requiring passports. We only require passporting, the QR code, if you are attending a program. And that is, again, the requirement of our ministry. It is not our requirement. So it is the requirement of the ministry. If you are doing an event, uh, a meeting, if you are renting out our spaces, that we have to have that. Uh, if you're coming in for library services or museum services, gallery services, you are not required to provide a passport. We do contact trace though. Uh, and then from our library uh, services bit, all of the information is in there. We've had quite a lot of um, 
activities happening, most definitely programs. Of note, and it's not in here, is that we do have uh, a new staff who is with us for the next few months. Uh, Ken Haig is with us again. Uh, he has circled back to the library for, I believe, his third stop in with us. Uh, so for those of you that may not know, Ken was the first CEO of Ellie Shore and was here when it um, merged uh, as a union library between Clarksburg and Thornbury. And then in uh, 98, when the Blue Mountains Public Library was actually created after the amalgamation, Ken was with us at that point. Um, after retiring, he had come back to the library some years later and recently retired from, um, uh, from Collingwood Public Library and is working here uh, part-time for the next few months over the winter before he starts the next chapter of his life. Uh, so the public has really enjoyed seeing him. Uh, he's been one of those staple faces over the decades with uh, Ellie Shore specifically, and many people walk in and it's just such a, a nice uh, surprise to see him at the front desk with customer service. So that was just a fantastic opportunity that we had uh, uh, some, some needs for staffing and he happened to retire right at the right time. So he's with us for a bit. Um, Archives and Museum, uh, we did a uh, partnership. Uh, seems like a lifetime ago, but we did a partnership uh, with the town for the Apple Harvest. Uh, that was a fantastic program, has gotten thousands of views, which is lovely to see. Uh, we continue to do programs there. And um, one thing which is has happened since this report came out um, that I will uh, mention for our uh, potential uh, key messages is that the depot just won gold on the community votes program for Gray County. So it is the gold museum vote uh, for our, our county, which is fantastic for a community museum to have reached that level of voting to be uh, ranked so high as making uh, an impact in people's lives on a daily basis okay. as an excellent service. So unless there's questions, that's all that I have. Morris. Um, Sabrina, do you mind going back on your thing there to the statistics? Certainly. Yeah, uh, not, no, uh, away that, at the front, yeah. I was just one wondering as a suggestion, not for this year, well, I don't know. Would it be possible to publish that if this is a monthly report uh, year to year, one year versus the other, like 2022 to date versus 21 to date, et cetera? Or is that too much work? No, or is it worthwhile? That. If that's something that the board is interested in. Are you thinking end of year 21 total stats or are you thinking comparing like January of 22 to January of 21? Well, actually both because the figures I'm looking at with the 4131, et cetera, active cardholders, that would be the, the as of December 31st, 21. It might be a one or two out. But uh, next year, we may have um, 4,200, 4,200, yeah. You know what I mean? That sort of thing is interesting to see whether, you know, in fact, we're increasing and or, or decreasing or in some, some areas. It's only a suggestion, that's all. It's it's uh, up to you. You're, you run the thing, but Sometimes, mo most of the times when I look at numbers, I say, well, okay, that's, that's this year, or in this year, 2021, but how did we do the year before? How does it compare? Mm -hmm. Joanne? Um, my, my question uh, through you to Sabrina, uh, um, and um, how will um, the pandemic affect the reporting of these numbers and, and, and how valid are these numbers? You know, I'm, I'm thinking that the, the virtual libraries would have higher, higher numbers um, or could you clarify that, Sabrina? I, Certainly. Is it, is a valid comparison my, is yes. my question. Uh, through you, Chair, um, the numbers are valid. We'll say that. Um, Accuracy is 
difficult with virtual because our our numbers for virtual are based on either who registers or one uh, one login. So an example is if we do a program, it'll say, is this for more than one individual? And you can say, yes, three people will be attending this all together, watching our TV, participating. We then count three. Uh, if somebody just registers for one person and then three end up watching, we have no way of capturing that. So if anything, the numbers are low. Um, but they are accurate for the statistics that we have access to. Uh, so it isn't a case that anything is made up. Statistics are correct. It's just the reality is how often are you know you signing yeah. up for a program and then your spouse sits down and says, what are we watching? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, so I'm just it. thinking of, of year ends when libraries close and libraries open and partial, et cetera. It, it's Certainly sort of the comparison, I think, will when we are looking at 2019, 2020, 2021, there's a lot of uh, fluidity in those. So in 20, we had much higher virtual programs, significantly lower face-to-face um, -face because it was closed. Even in 2020, we found the circulation was down because there was a period of four months that we weren't allowed to open and do anything other than virtual programs and electronic mm -hmm. collections. Then we moved to curbside and it took some time to pick back up with the physical collections. So if we were to compare 2019, which would be sort of that last typical to now, we'll certainly see some changes. Um, I don't anticipate the way libraries are being used now necessarily going back to 2019 though. People have changed the way they're using all services. Um, hours have had to be adjusted based on where people are. People are looking to be earlier and be home at the end of the day. They're not, you know, staying out until eight o'clock at night, uh, running errands anymore. Just the, the lifestyle that people have has really changed. Um, the types of programs that we used to do online for teens, for example, don't have the traction now because teens are totally burned out from online school. Whereas they thought it was a really great way of doing teen programming two years ago. So we've changed a lot of those pieces. And I, I would expect that although numbers will pick up moving forward, we may not necessarily ever go back to what 2019 looked like. Thank you. Um, so your, the request is that you do add comparative numbers. Um, and I guess it's best to leave it to you to decide what's the best way to do that. Um, of course, yeah. And um, maybe even you'll have to add some commentary if numbers are really like wacky, <laughs> you know, why is that? Thank you. Um, so I'd like to uh, ask for a mover and seconder that the board receive the strategic plan discussions as information all the discussions we've just had. Mover, please. Joanne, seconder, Dorothy, all in favor? Carrie. Uh, other business, there's three pieces of other business. Um, the first one is the uh, board legacy webinar, uh, which is coming up on February 15th and uh, wondering, uh, that requires registration. I believe it's a free session uh, through the Ontario Library Service, um, but they would like people to register. So I guess if, I'd be looking to see if there's somebody interested in participating in that hour long session just for our board's information. Anybody available to do that? It's February 15th, which is a Tuesday from four to five. Joanne. Thank you. And I will try to be patient. <laughs> I was going to say, you're volunteering with a frown on your face. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, Sabrina, will you arrange that registration? Is that I will. Um, great? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. And I'm sure if anyone else wants to, uh, you're more than welcome to just ask, maybe in touch with Sabrina to make that happen. 
Um, the second one is uh, really, I guess, an information item, the um, governance hub for year four. Um, and this is for those of you who aren't aware, it's an Ontario Library Service a website that is specifically directed at boards and governance issues. And it is suggesting what are the main um, topics that a board needs to deal with in year four. So for example, as we see from the board, one of them is the board legacy documents that you would put forward. Um, another would be the recruitment uh, process for board members. And, and while that's a town responsibility, how the board might support that process. So that's information on the governance hub for people to take a look at. And just so you know, we um, four years ago, we did do a fairly intensive process for recruiting board members because, well, I guess we knew we were having a lot of turnover then. Um, and uh, we'll be looking at, uh, Sabrina sent me the documents we prepared last time. So we'll, that'll be coming up as a board discussion. Um, and I forget which month, maybe March. Um, and the third item under other business was Sabrina, who made a presentation to uh, the Finance Committee at the Ontario Legislature, if you'd like to comment on that for us. Ooh. Certainly. So that was my, um, my first role as the president of the Ontario Library Association. I've actually been presenting uh, to the legislature uh, individually. Uh, we used to do a day at Queen's Park where uh, various librarians would basically swarm Queen's Park and have presentations to ministers, deputy ministers, staffers, whoever we could find having to do with the various asks of uh, the province. Uh, this year, due to COVID, it was done a bit differently. So we ended up uh, actually registering as witnesses. I believe that there were three library staff uh, CEOs who were able to make presentations. Um, I was one of those. So we, we made the presentations uh, specific to the budget. I also uh, presented that information to the bear and the um, community task force on Wednesday because there was quite a lot of information that having watched the last week's and then this week's uh, legislative hearings from the finance standing finance committee, it felt like much of what our community is doing is head and shoulders statistically and gathering of information more than what other communities are presenting to the legislature. So uh, I also worked with the, uh, the, uh, the town to see if possibly we could get some of the business recovery aspect off to the legislature before the deadline on the 27th. So I believe I'll be uh, working with uh, the mayor and, uh, uh, and the, the village association to get some of that information over to the standing committee as well. Good, thank you. Um, moving on to the uh, round table and community updates. Well, screen is already and, covered. Uh, Madam Chair, sorry, the OLA boot camp was the third one that we were going to hit there. Um, oh. Just a reminder that it is February 5th. It is the Saturday. Uh, we have uh, in the past, we would register one or two people who wanted to drive uh, and go to the program in Toronto. Given that it's online, we've purchased an institutional membership, so anybody can attend. I just need to know so that I can get your login information to you. I believe uh, in 2020, uh, we had Dorothy and Gary attend. Um, I'm trying to remember last year, I think maybe Joanne and... No. Lori attended? Mm -hmm. Just Lori. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, all of the board, none of the board, you can attend of interest. Um, and that's just for the Saturday program, but we also have uh, the membership will give you the full week of conference proceedings. So certainly, if anybody would like to look and see if there's any sessions that speak to you about governance, they don't just put it all on the Saturday. Uh, and like last year, it is going to be recorded. Uh, you don't have the opportunity to participate and ask questions, but it will be recorded. So if there's something you can't do on that day, it is usually up and available until either July or sometime into August before they take that down now. Great, thank you. I'm glad you reminded me, I knew I'd forget. Um, the next item on the round table, we, um, 
Sabrina have already commented on the uh, the depot winning the uh, gold and the community votes. So congratulations on that. We were just shy of the platinum by a handful of votes, not even like tens of votes, a handful of votes to surpass Gray County Museum which be, uh, to hit Gray Roots. So that that's, I mean, our community stepped up and said, this is an important service, which is something that um, we heard throughout the strategic plan consultation as well. Our museum is invaluable to this community. So we can't look at it in a way that feels like it's the, you know, the lesser sibling of the two facilities. Okay. Um, the MPL special events, uh, that's really an information item for all of us. Is there any questions on that? Otherwise I will ask for mover and seconder to receive it's information, the roundtable discussions. I see Gary and Andrea. Thank you, all in favor. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, key messages, uh, if you could pull that up for us, Sabrina, that would be great. Um, this is the messages that the board wants to communicate from the board meeting. And uh, you mentioned that you, I believe you said, you had not yet added the winning of the gold. I, I read this a few days ago now. I forget if you had that on there yet or not, but you should. Ah, oh, yes, there it is, good. I highlighted the pieces that have been changed since okay. the report came out to the board. So it's easier to see what, what's in there. Great, thank you. Can you go back to the first one, please? Mm -hmm. So the first one I highlighted just to make sure that the draft is matching what we actually did. Um, is it the actual strategic plan or it's really the pillars and goals that the board has approved for public feedback? Thank you. Is that fine? Does anyone have any, uh, or else you asked to go back, so that cover it for you? Oh yeah, yeah, I just, she went very fast. I didn't quite see what it said, but right. yeah, no, I'm good. Okay, good, thank you. Um, so this, uh, the stuff that's not highlighted, we saw earlier, it was in the board package. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. Um, so those highlighted pieces are the two new ones. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone very okay with those? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, seems good. Great. Okay, that's it. Um, in that case, I would like to look for, I get a mover and seconder that the board approved the release of the key messages update January, 2021. So move. Joanne and Morris, all in favor? Carried, thank you very much. Um, notice of meeting dates. Our next uh, regularly scheduled meeting is February 17 at 2 p.m. Um, I expect this will again be a Zoom meeting. Unless any people say they're really desperate to get together in person. Um, we will now go into closed session and just for the uh, public record, when we come back from closed session, it will really to be uh, just approving and the um, uh, resolutions made and closed and then adjourning. So there won't be any substantive discussion after, uh, after this. What? So we'll be, uh, so I would like to uh, get a, a motion um, that with regard to section 16.1 bracket four on bracket of the Public Libraries Act, 
that this board do now move into closed session in order to address matters pertaining to personal matters about an identifiable individual. Can I have a mover and seconder for that, please? Dorothy, seconder. Andrea, all in favor? Carried. So we have moved into closed session as of 4.40. Thank you very much. So we adjourned at 5.12. And I think um, all I'm looking for now is a, uh, now that we're in open session again, that the board approve all resolutions and recommendations made in the closed session. Mover, please. Uh, Dorothy, and I see Andrea is a seconder. All in favor? Lovely, thank you. And I believe that is it. We're running a little bit over time, but I appreciate your patience and uh, yeah, so thank you very much, and I will see you soon. Uh, yes, Jorcy, uh, Jesse. <laughs> I want to congratulate you on your first meeting, which was really well run. Thank you very much, Jesse. Thank you all. Okay, and on that happy note, <laughs> I will declare the meeting adjourned at 5.13.